it's time to talk to a friend of the show, Helen Dale. Now, Helen's latest column, I was reading it last night in bed, it's fascinating. In effect, she says that some of the biggest, most fundamental leaps forward in society and civilization have been kind of from the bottom up. Ordinary people making extraordinary contributions, either individually or collectively. Yes, yes, we need the Einsteins and the Newtons and the Brunels, but, but normal people with, with a halfway decent education, not, not even degrees or diplomas, have the same potential to trigger big and lasting changes in society, evolutionary changes in society. And Helen's here now. It's a fascinating concept, Helen, and, 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 and you argue it very, very in a very detailed way. And reading it last night, I thought, you know what, she's right. When did it occur to you? Well, it's not actually an, an idea that's original to me, I have to, to okay. say. It's not my idea at all. Um, <laughs> the article, by the way, is in this magazine, in Standpoint, which I'm going to have to hold up for YouTube viewers okay. um, on talk radio. Well, we've got it. Because it's, it's an unusually large magazine. Take it down. Magazine. That's enough now. Take it down. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's very beautifully done. They, they, they do a, a lovely presentation. Okay. But the... Um, the book where I got this argument from is this. It's by Matt Ridley, and it's called How Innovation Works. Mm -hmm. And the argument that you set out very clearly earlier is basically what he sets out in this book. But as you can see, it's a decently fat book. Hmm. It's quite large. OK, we'll go, we'll and, go on. I mean, I, I summarised it, but you, you, you give me yeah. your, your take on it. Why would it... Uh, what? Why, go oh, on, sorry. sorry. Well, OK, just give me some examples then of the kind of the kind of innovation, the kind of leap forward that's happened not top down, but bottom up. I, I think you mentioned something to do with steam in your article. The, the st nearly all of the steam ones, basically. Now, Newcomen, Thomas Newcomen was the Newcomen engine, which was d developed to pump water out of coal mines. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, my partner is an engineer, and one of the things that uh, is said amongst uh, engineers, particularly mining engineers, that there are three things you have to worry about um, in coal mining and mining generally. You have to worry about fire, you have to worry about flood, and you have to worry about something else that begins with F and um, ends with up. But I won't say, or otherwise <laughs> you'll have to press the big red. I think you mean. I think you mean mistakes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. And so flood was really serious. Now it could happen gradually, or it could also happen very dramatically, and and kill everybody in the mine, kill all the mine mine workers. Yep. And so for a, a, a whole range of unusual reasons, I mean, because other civilizations mined coal as well, like the the Romans did, um, and the and the ancient Chinese did also. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a whole range of complex reasons in Britain at that time, people b who owned mines, mine owners and mine workers came to care more about the life of miners than they did about uh, money, simply just yeah. money, basically. And there are all sorts of reasons for this, which Matt Ridley goes into. And so an enormous amount of effort was put in by lots of people. And this is a big point of Ridley's that um, innovation and invention are different things. Invention really is the incredible person who comes up with a new and novel idea that no one's done before. Mm -hmm. But it's actually quite rare, um, so much so that off the top of my head, because it's, I, I wrote this piece last month, uh, I can't actually think of one, but Ridley does go through a couple of examples of where you just get a person coming up with something amazing out of the blue. So hang on, but, so, so, so to cut to the chase here then, we have mine owners, private mine owners in this country and nowhere else in the world back in the 18th century, looking at this problem, 18th, 19th century, looking at this problem of flooded mines and thinking, mm -hmm. I don't want my workers toiling in the water. I don't want them drowning. Uh, we've, got, we've got to get this water out. How do we do it? And somebody thinks it thinks it through and develops a steam engine, which can pump. And yes. this is the only purpose of the steam engine is to pump water out of flooded mines. And then yes, some, that's all it is. That's all it is. At the beginning, that's all it is. And then some other bright spark comes along and looks at this and says, "Do you know we could adapt that? We could use that, and in effect, to build a steam engine on wheels. How does that? Yes. How does that process take place?" And and basically what what happens is you get this cross fertilization of ideas sometimes because people know each other sometimes because there's public records in the in the form of patents because that's another early innovation yep. as well that 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 in came in the uk uh, the, uh, and it's patents weren't first copyright was first the statute of anne was actually part which was the first form of statutory copyright in the world was actually passed in the uk in 1710 
So right. that, in, at least initially, although there are problems with it now, as Matt Ridley says, because basically the term limits are too long. Mm -hmm. So it's actually having the effect of stifling innovation rather than promoting it. Right. So sometimes you get public records in the form of patents. Uh, often you get this this version of simultaneous evolution, which we tend to associate, and Ridley is a, a zoologist originally, so of course he can't help but hmm. tell these kind of stories. Hmm. A crow figures out how to use a tool in one country and then suddenly crows in other countries can do the same thing. And it's almost as if there's some kind of weird psychic link between them, but there isn't. It's this simultane simultaneous evolution. Wow. And it happens in it happens in science. Well, you see, I as always well. I mean, I've always been fascinated by by corvids and the fact that they're one of the very very few birds who actually do use tools. They bend wires, they they, they use them as rods. Mm. It's quite extraordinary. And I and I knew that I knew that that that, that uh, feature had had emerged, as you say, uh, on different continents at roughly the same time. Same I time, always yes. assumed that maybe a crow picked up in a storm and blown across the channel or blown from France down into Italy or blown across the Mediterranean and had taken that knowledge with them. But you're saying it actually occurs simultaneously, more or less, and spontaneously. That's incredible. Yes, and it happens, well, I mean, it happen, It doesn't, it's not just corvids, it's not just orcas. You get it with orcas as well. There's, there's evidence of orca pods in separate areas learning, see, seeming to figure out very clever things at the same time without necessarily having contact with each other. So there are these points really, along the evolutionary path which are yeah. almost predestined. These are the moments where the, the, the species as a whole, which has been on the planet for the same time, whichever continent it happens to be on, this is the point, this is the light bulb moment that, that goes on across the world. Amazing. And anyway, Ridley's argument is that it happens with people, right. with science. Well, what I mean, probably science is probably the wrong word, and because this is a point that he makes, is that it's not, strictly speaking, what we associate with traditional scientific research and development. It's much more engineering, and particularly the engineering that you associate with professional engineers, not in universities. They tend to be engineers in the military or engineers in coal mines or engineers in industry. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily, particularly historically, although this has tended to change more recently, not tertiary educated people who learnt through a trade. I mean, Newcomen was, was an ironmonger. And um, so you get people... <sighs> I'm going to, this is going to sound dreadfully sexist, but in a positive way, you get this whole phenomenon of blokes in sheds, <laughs> fiddling with things. And, and sometimes it's a literal bloke in a shed. Uh, the, the chap who came up with the electronic cigarette, I mean, this is a nice small one. You can yeah. get much fancier ones than that. Yeah. Chinese chap was actually, and this is really interesting because it's quite difficult in China for this kind of innovation to happen. They tend to want it to be government controlled. Right. But he was a pharmacist. He was he was a well-educated man. He's a well-educated man. He's still alive. Um, and he had a smoking. He couldn't quit. He tried nicotine patches um, and, and it was driving him up the wall. It was driving his wife up the wall. It was driving his kids up the wall. Right. You know, they were all smoking like chimneys, basically. And he was just this classic bloke in a shed tinkering with stuff. You know, I mean, with some men, it's a train set or, or something, right. you know, it's just so they're out and out in the shed. And he eventually the, the thing that he did was he he miniaturized something, an idea that already existed out there, which is you have a non combustible way of ingesting nicotine because the thing that kills you with smoking is not the nicotine, it's the tar. It's the tar, that's yes. actually a, yeah. That's the quote from the US Surgeon General at the time when the, in the United States they were starting to take action against cigarette companies. It's, it's putting burning things down in you is very unhealthy. So he had, so so what, he had, he had an inspiration from an, exist, an existing invention. Uh, how, yeah. did, how did he develop it then? Well, what he did, uh, because battery technology had improved, you see the battery is in the bottom part of this, mm -hmm. and it's very small. It's not much larger than a normal cigarette thing. I, you would smoke. I can't quite see it. Are we talking about a vape here? Yes, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's an electronic cigarette. Yeah, got it. Right. Um, and uh, and mine is quite a small one. Hmm. Right, carry on. You can get bigger ones, but uh, mine is quite small and it just looks like a cigarette, basically. And so what he did was new inno innovations that other people had done, not him, he was a pharmacist. You know, so he knew all about nicotine patches and nicotine. And what he did was apply battery technology that other people had developed to the idea of ingesting nicotine 
but without the combustion, which is what gives people lung cancer gotcha. and, and gotcha. also contributes to heart disease and all sorts of other problems, but particularly lung cancer. Lung cancer is the really big one. And so he miniaturized the idea that another person had come up with, I think in America actually, uh, of the battery and came up with an electronic cigarette. And, is this and he used it to... And this man lives in in, in communist uh, in, China. In, in communist China, his name's Ong Meek. But, yeah. but is he uh, fabulously wealthy because of this? It, it, he's not as fabulously wealthy as a Western person would be. Unfortunately, this is I mean, this is one of the things that Matt Ridley discusses very, very se sensitively and thoughtfully in uh, how innovation works. Is oh. how China has managed to turn its universities into engines of progress and innovation all right well let's let's, the, let's leave that book and that subject there because we've only got about four four minutes left and i want to talk to you about a couple of other things but that was fascinating i knew it would be yes, um yes. Having, having read your article i knew it was going to be interesting and it really was i love the stuff about crows it's just extraordinary um yeah it's just really amazing story it is, yeah. isn't it it really is thank you um now look obviously you're australian uh presumably you ain't going to be going home anytime soon because you can't go there you're not allowed no i can't i've actually had to have a very long and awkward conversation with my bank in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank, which is a leading Aussie bank, mm -hmm. um, in order to arrange to have things like credit cards delivered to me in the UK, because I normally go back every year and yep. I can't. Yep. Basically, it's that simple. And what do you think of that? I, I do, 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 do as, as I was talking to a councillor in Nottinghamshire earlier, do you suck it up and think, well, it, it's, it's the price we have to pay to, to squash the virus, or do you think it's nonsense? Um, I am not sure I'm not completely sold on the way people, states have responded to coronavirus. Now, it is well known, and everyone has made this point, that um, New Zealand and Australia have done very well. And hmm. as I said to Mike Graham previously, Australia's worst performing state, Victoria, has actually done better than Germany, the EU's best performing state. Yep. And the explanation I traditionally give for this is high state capacity. If Australian governments turn their hands to doing something, they generally do it well. They do less. <laughs> Unlike us. <laughs> yes. They do less. The Australian and New Zealand governments do less. The governments in that sense are smaller as a part of, as a proportion of the economy. So they devolve responsibility but to the people. More, but the stuff that they do do, they do very, very well. However, there is an unfortunate trade-off with that. And I have been, I have said this on to Mike Graham and also on trigonometry, a, a chat show I've been on, is people who go there uh, to us, both Australia and New Zealand, although it's very noticeable in Australia, hmm. observe that, that it is a very authoritarian country. Right. There are signs everywhere telling you what to do. And this sort of very bad behaviour by the police, arresting people in their homes and breaking up gatherings and so on, that we've only just started to see mm -hmm. in Britain in the last month or so, mm -hmm. Um, has been going on in Australia, particularly Victoria, because the other states have come out of lockdown now and the economy's basically gone back to normal. But okay. particularly in Victoria, that authoritarianism, um, I, it, it's been going on in Australia for months. And what and what do you make of the situation in, in this country where people who are, are very dubious about lockdown are, I mean, I've had it, it's happened to me a couple of times now, in, in, not in a particularly sort of aggressive way, but people said that I'm a, a COVID denier, which I absolutely am not. I see that COVID is a major problem for, for, the, for the planet. I don't deny it at all. I just question the weapons that we're using to try and fight it. W what do you say to people who say that, who say that if you're a lockdown... Well, I mean, you're, you're a denier. Well, this is a part of a broader problem of assuming that anybody who says that there's a problem with a policy, whether it's at the government level or even internally, is a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> now, that conspiracy theorists exist. Yep. There are people out there who think that 5G causes coronavirus. There are also people out there who think there was no anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. One of them appears to be Jeremy Corbyn. Um, you have to be very, very careful with just writing your political opponents off as conspiracy theorists. You need to read what they say and engage with their arguments. Stop saying it's because of who is paying their salary or that kind of thing and take the arguments on the merits. And in the, the twenty seconds, we in, in the 30 seconds we have left, you mentioned Corbyn. Do you think Corbyn should either resign from the Labour Party or should be kicked out of the Labour Party? Well, the usual method of, of dealing with people who... who, who who, who won't be told in those circumstances is to withdraw the whip. 
So okay. let him run as an independent and see how he goes at the next election. That's a really good point to end it. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely talking to you, Helen. It's our, our first conversation. I knew it was going to be interesting, and it was. That's Helen Dale, writer, lawyer and political commentator.